What if I told you that everything, yes, everything we know about the universe can ultimately be traced back to one of the simplest yet most profound building blocks of nature, the atom. Atoms are mind-bogglingly small. For perspective, a single human hair is about a million atoms wide, carbon atoms. Atoms are so small, they're invisible even to the most powerful optical microscopes because they're smaller than the shortest wavelength of visible light. And yet, this tiny structure holds the keys to understanding the entire universe. An atom is the smallest unit of matter that still retains the properties we see in the macroscopic world, like the chemical and physical characteristics of substances. But it's also a quantum entity with discrete energy levels and unique interaction properties. And here's the kicker. This humble atom interacts with all four fundamental forces of nature. The entire framework of physics is at play within something we can't even see. You can think of it as an object that connects our macro world to the quantum world. So by understanding the atom, we can understand how the entire universe works. But how did we figure all this out? How do the various parts of an atom operate? And how does it provide a clue to the workings of the rest of the universe? Stay tuned, because that's coming up right now. Our understanding of the atom is surprisingly recent. Less than 100 years ago, scientists were arguing about what atoms look like. The concept of atoms, though, goes all the way back to ancient Greece. The term atom comes from the Greek word atomos, meaning indivisible. Early Greek philosophers imagined that if you take any kind of matter and keep dividing it into smaller parts, there will come a point at which it would no longer be divisible. These tiny indivisible objects of various shapes, they thought, make up everything in the world. This is a simple idea, but it laid the foundation for some of the greatest scientific discoveries that followed. Fast forward to the early 19th century when John Dalton, an English chemist, took the idea further. Dalton described atoms as small, hard spheres that were indivisible with identical atoms for each element. It was a step forward, but the idea of atoms being indivisible wouldn't hold up for long. In the late 1800s, J.J. Thompson discovered something shocking. He found that atoms themselves were made up of even smaller particles. Passing an electric current through a vacuum tube, he observed that it was attracted by positively charged metal plates, but repelled by negatively charged ones. This proved that the current flowing through the tube was made up of negatively charged particles, which we now call electrons. Measuring the deflection of the beam revealed that these electrons were about 2,000 times lighter than the lightest atom. Thompson then proposed a plum pudding atomic model, where electrons were scattered inside a positively charged sphere. But this model didn't last long either. Ernest Rutherford, Thompson's own student, performed an experiment intending to verify this plum pudding idea, but it ended up shattering it instead. The premise was simple. If atoms are overall neutral with evenly distributed charges, a beam of positively charged particles pointed at a thin sheet of metal should pass straight through. When Rutherford conducted this experiment, what he found was that while most of it did pass right through, some of the alpha particles were deflected at large angles, and a very small fraction of them even bounced back completely. Making sense of these results required a whole new atomic model. Rutherford had discovered the positively charged nucleus. To explain the very small probability of bouncing back, indicating a head-on collision, the nucleus must be tiny, he figured. Just one femtometer, or 10 to the negative 15 meters across while most of the atom is empty, with the electrons orbiting about 100,000 times further away. The negatively charged electrons then, he thought, must be kept in an orbit around a positively charged nucleus, due to the electromagnetic force, one of the four fundamental forces of nature. But here's where it gets even more interesting. If electrons were orbiting around a nucleus, they must be undergoing a constant acceleration due to the circular orbit. But charges undergoing acceleration emit electromagnetic waves, also known as light. So if electrons were simply point-like particles orbiting a nucleus like planets around the sun, they would quickly radiate away all their energy and spiral inwards, eventually crashing into the nucleus. In other words, it would be impossible for atoms to be stable. To resolve this conundrum, 
French physicist Louis de Broglie proposed a revolutionary idea. Electrons aren't just particles, they behave like waves too. These waves can only exist at specific discrete energy levels. It's like a guitar string. When you pluck it, only certain harmonics or standing waves are allowed. Electrons work kind of the same way. They orbit the nucleus in stable patterns where the wave fits perfectly in the orbit. No more and no less. These energy levels are like rungs on a ladder. Electrons can jump between them, but they can't exist in between. When an electron drops from a higher energy level to a lower one, it releases energy in the form of a photon, a packet of light. The energy of this photon precisely matches the energy gap between the levels. And when electrons absorb a photon, it's like getting a quantum boost, which leaps them to a higher energy state. What's remarkable is that these energy transitions of electrons in any atom, when going from one energy level to another, are unique for every element. It's determined by the number of protons in the nucleus. They act as atomic fingerprints, producing distinct spectral lines that scientists can use to identify elements in stars, galaxies, and even distant planets. It's like decoding the makeup of the universe by reading its light. The photon in this case isn't just a messenger, it's also a carrier of the electromagnetic force, enabling interactions between charged particles. The electromagnetic force is the second strongest fundamental force and plays a crucial role in shaping the world as we know it. Besides ensuring the stability of atoms, it determines the unique set of properties for each element. There are about 90 naturally occurring elements on Earth, which combine in countless ways, forming the molecules and structures we see in the universe. So from the simplest hydrogen atom to the most complex molecules in living organisms, atoms and their electromagnetic interactions are the architects of everything around us and beyond. But here's a puzzle. If protons inside the nucleus are all positively charged, they should repel each other strongly due to the electromagnetic interaction. So why don't nuclei just fall apart? Before I answer that, you might be wondering what it takes to produce videos like this. Well, I have a team of animators, editors, and fact checkers that help me make these videos. This is not easy or cheap. Each video takes about a month, specialized skills, and costs thousands of dollars to produce. But our sponsor today, InVideo AI, has what I think is an astonishing way to produce videos independent of your skill level at very low cost with very little technical training. You can just type in the idea you want to create a video about and InVideo will create a video according to your specifications within minutes. This is the video it created for me when I put in the following prompt. Create a video to show how all the fundamental forces of nature are inside an atom. Talk about the strong force, weak force, electromagnetism, and gravity. Present it in a way that someone with a high school education can understand. I'm amazed at the quality of this video. In my mind, this is game changing. You can even edit whatever you want by text commands like add my voice. There's no steep learning curve. It's like having an entire video team at your beck and call. And even more amazing, you can try InVideo for free at the link in your screen or in the description. It'll save you hundreds if not thousands in editing, animation, and other production costs. Be sure to give it a try at the link in the description. Now, let's get back to answer the question of why don't positively charged protons in the nucleus repel each other? The answer lies in one of the universe's most powerful forces, the strong force or strong interaction. At distances smaller than a femtometer, the strong force takes over, overwhelming the electromagnetic repulsion between protons. It's 137 times stronger than the electromagnetic force inside a nucleus. This force holds protons and neutrons, collectively called nucleons, together. But the real secret lies even deeper. Protons and neutrons themselves aren't indivisible. They're made up of even smaller particles called quarks. Quarks come in six types, or flavors. But inside protons and neutrons, you'll find only two, up quarks and down quarks. Up quarks carry a positive fractional electric charge of two-thirds, and down quarks carry a negative charge of negative one-third. But they can only combine to form particles with an integer charge. So for example, Protons are made up of two up quarks and one down quark, giving them a positive charge of plus one, while neutrons consist of one up quark and two down quarks, making them electronically neutral. 
Here's where things get wild. Quarks don't just have an electric charge. They also carry what's called a color charge. But don't take the term literally. It's just a metaphor to describe a kind of charge. These are not literally optical colors. There are three color and anti-color charges, red, green, and blue, RGB. For a particle to exist, its combination of color charges must be neutral or colorless. There are two ways a neutral charge can occur. One is when a red, a green, and a blue charge quark combine. The other is when a color and anti-color charged quarks combine. This rule only allows two types of quark composite particles, called baryons. They can be made up of three quarks of three different colors. This is what a proton or neutron contains, or they can be made up of a quark and anti-quark pair with color anti-color charges. This is what a meson contains. If we zoom in to look inside a proton or neutron, what we'll find is the strong force at work. The three quarks are constantly exchanging gluons, which are the carriers of the strong force. They allow a constant exchange of color charges. This creates an incredibly powerful attractive force. So strong, in fact, that it's equivalent to the weight of a 10-ton truck acting over a distance of just 10 to the negative 15 meters. And that's not all. If you try and pull quarks apart, the force between them actually grows stronger, like pulling a spring, which gets harder and harder as you pull it further apart. It brings them back together. In fact, if you apply enough energy to separate quarks, the gluon field snaps, creating new quark-antiquark pairs, which is a meson. And it is the exchange of these mesons between protons and neutrons that binds them together in the nucleus. I have a detailed video on how this works if you want to learn more, right up here. This is why quarks and gluons are never seen alone. They're always locked inside larger particles, like protons and neutrons. And it's this strong force that's responsible for the underlying stability of matter. This immense force is also what powers nuclear fusion in stars, when lighter nuclei combine to form heavier ones, releasing large amounts of energy. And it's the same energy from the strong force in the nuclei of atoms that's unleashed in nuclear bombs, which shows us the staggering amount of energy locked inside the atom. But the strong force isn't the only player in the quantum game. In some types of atoms, radioactive processes can occur that modify the composition of a nucleus. The most well-known is alpha decay, where a nucleus splits into smaller pieces by ejecting an alpha particle made up of two protons and two neutrons, which is the same as a helium nucleus. This is mediated by the strong and electromagnetic interactions. However, the less common beta decay, where a neutron transforms into a proton while emitting an electron and an antineutrino, cannot be explained by these two forces. At first sight, the emission of an electron might look like an electromagnetic process, but the involvement of the Neutron and neutrino, which are not electrically charged, means that this decay is instead the result of a whole new fundamental force. That force is called the weak force. The name is very fitting because it's a million times weaker than the strong force at femtometer scales. The weak force operates at incredibly short ranges, only about 0.1% of the diameter of a proton. This is due to its mediators the W and Z bosons. Unlike photons and gluons, these particles are massive, about 80 times the mass of a proton. Now you might ask, how can something 80 times the mass of a proton be created inside a proton? Well, the nature of quantum mechanics is such that there's a probability that such a massive particle can be created spontaneously. According to Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, such large energy fluctuations can exist, but only for a very brief amount of time. This makes the weak force short-lived and localized. Yet, it's the only force that's able to change the flavor of quarks, meaning it can change, for example, a down quark into an up quark, transforming neutrons into protons, and vice versa. Beta decay has useful applications. Take carbon-14, for example. It has six protons and eight neutrons, making it unstable. Over time, one of its neutrons transforms into a proton, turning it into nitrogen-14. This process has a half-life of 5,730 years. So by looking at the ratio of carbon-14 to regular carbon-12 in fossils, 
archaeologists can determine its age. You might ask, should an interaction that changes the identity of elements really be called a force? After all, the intuitive definition of a force is something that attracts, repels, or causes objects to move. Well, the weak force actually does that too. Due to the conservation of momentum, a particle emitting a W or Z boson will recoil in the opposite direction, and a particle absorbing such a boson will gain momentum along its propagation direction. Think about it as throwing a heavy ball from one stationary boat towards another. The boats start moving away from each other, appearing to have felt a repulsive force. Now, of course, in the case of the weak force, any resulting movement happens at such small scales that it's essentially imperceptible. Now, the name weak force can make this sound like it's unimportant, but it plays a crucial role in the universe. Inside hydrogen stars, it produces the neutrons needed to set off nuclear fusion into helium. Without it, stars as we know them wouldn't shine and would not be able to synthesize the heavier elements necessary for life. And the word weak is somewhat misleading. It's actually not the weakest in the universe. Gravity, which we constantly experience in our everyday life, turns out to be shockingly weaker compared to the weak force at atomic scales. In fact, it's about 10 to the 32 times weaker than the weak force and 10 to the 36 times weaker than the electromagnetic force. To give you an example, this is a Van de Graaff generator, a device that creates static electricity on a metal sphere. It lifts all these strands against the force of gravity of the entire Earth. You can try a similar experiment at home by rubbing a balloon on your shirt to deposit a few electrons on it. Then bring it near your hair. It lift your hair strands straight up. So gravity is really weak, but thanks to the overall neutrality of atoms, gravity is the one that shapes the universe as we know it pulling matter together to create large-scale structures in which galaxies, stars, and planets like ours can form. All atoms interact with gravity due to their mass. Note that at the fundamental level, the masses of elementary particles within the atoms, that is the quarks and electrons, comes from their interactions with the Higgs field. But you may be surprised to learn that only about 1% of an atom's mass comes from adding up the masses of its fundamental components. So where does the remaining 99% come from? According to the theory of general relativity, any object with energy has the ability to curve the fabric of space-time. This curvature is what creates gravity. And at the very core, atoms contain a tremendous amount of energy concentrated in the strong interaction between quarks inside nuclei. Einstein's equation equals mc squared reminds us that this energy from the strong force gives rise to the rest mass of atoms and to the gravitational force we observe. The big takeaway is that every fundamental force can be observed within an atom. From the strong force gluing quarks together to the weak force transforming elements to the electromagnetic force binding electrons to the nucleus. And even gravity shaping space-time itself. And all are on display in the simplest building block of matter. This means the atom isn't just the foundation of all matter, it's also our greatest window into the universe's fundamental workings. The more we learn about this humble entity, the more we'll uncover the profound elegance of the universe itself. So if someone asks the question, how did we learn so much about the universe? You can tell them that the universe is contained in every atom of their body. I'll see you in the next video, my friend.